Well, good morning, everybody. Here we are again. It's a Sunday again. Oh, my goodness. So welcome to Trinity. We're glad to have you here this morning. We're talking about a continuing um, sermon series for several weeks now, and today it's Dynasty Family Squabble. So, of course, we're all a church family, and we hope we're not squabbling this morning. <laughs> so please join us as we sing Not Be Shaken. Debbie Wilson, your director of contemporary worship music, and I'm always glad to be here on Sunday morning. You know, it's funny this summer because we see all these familiar faces, and then we see all these familiar faces missing because they're on vacation, and then they come back, and we're so glad to see them again. So, yeah, thank you for coming back. Please sing this song with us as well. Blessed be your name. streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness 
closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Pastor Liz Fry, it's an honor to be leading you in worship this morning at Trinity. So welcome, where we are united and empowered to worship, connect, and serve. As always, we'll, we will be uh, celebrating communion this morning. Um, all are welcome to come forward to receive the body and blood of Christ. Uh, but if you prefer, you are also welcome to come forward for a blessing this morning. We continue our... Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Sermon series. Good golly, you'd think I would know this by now. This is the second time I've done this this morning. Um, we continue our sermon series on dynasty. Uh, our theme for this morning is family squabble. And Pastor John Brock will be giving us a wonderful message, giving us detailed history about this family squabble, things that I didn't even know that I heard earlier this morning. So that's telling you something. Um, la- <laughs> and I just admitted that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, last weekend was World Hunger Weekend. We raised $4,400 last weekend. But there's still opportunities to give. There are still envelopes in the gathering space to give to World Hunger and those in need. Um, 
the parking lot. We are still continuing um, that work, and that is still expected to be done August 24th. Um, The next steps are grinding, paving, and striping, whatever that may be. We leave that to the experts. Um, But that will be done August 24th. Uh, Let's see. Um, We want to continue to give thanks for those who have given to the Capitol Appeal. Um, And if you haven't done so, please consider giving to Trinity's future through the Capitol Appeal. Um, This morning, maybe as we speak, um, we will be, we are welcoming a new child of God into our family. Um, Edwin Sodadasi is being baptized over in the traditional service right now. Um, he's the son of Paul and Deepta Sodadasi. So we give thanks for a new child of God. And we also give thanks for Max Wilkin, who affirmed his baptism last night at the Saturday service. Um, let's see. And my last announcement for this morning is we have a death that affects our community. Uh, Lois Tress died on August the 7th. We will celebrate Lois's life and tell stories and um, worship God this Saturday, August the 18th, with a 10 a.m. visitation and an 11 a.m. service. And I believe that's all the announcements I have for the good of the community. We will continue with confession and forgiveness, so please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In mercy, in the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Give us this bread always, that that he may live in us and we in him, and that strengthened by this food, we may live as his body in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, today's first reading is from the 18th chapter of Second Samuel. King David ordered Joab and, and Abishai and Hittai, and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard what when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding his mule, And the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was left standing, he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. 
and ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and, and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite came and the Cushite said, Good tide for my lord the king, for the lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, It is well with the young man Absalom. The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber, chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, what I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The children are invited to come up for a story. The name of my story this morning is Tusami Hands Part 2. Remember, Tusami Hands, the American version of that word would be two same hands. So last week, Hammond was about to tell his mother and father about the unthinkable he, thing he did to Polly when he switched his arm with her arm. And now Hammond felt much better than he did before. And now Polly is the one afflicted with Tusami Hans. When he told them, his father said loudly, well, well, well. And his mother said, oh, Hammond, how could you? And Hammond was so ashamed and so sorry. Nurse Fran said, let me take a look at Polly. And she barely touched the usually sweet, calm Polly. And instead of being the old sweet Polly, Polly was now wretched. And she literally screamed, don't touch me. Mommy said, she's been like this for several weeks and we're just at our wit's end. Hammond understood but he said nothing more. Nurse Fran looked carefully at Polly's Tusami hand, and she whispered something silent in, in Polly's ear. And then Nurse Fran got out her looking glass, and she carefully examined Polly's Tusami hand. Nurse's, Nurse Fran's expression grew very serious. She drew back her head, and she said, I am afraid when Hammond pulled out Polly's arm that dark night, he seriously damaged her humerus bone, which is connected to the tickle ya bone, which is connected to the wish bone, which is connected to the funny bone. I may be wrong. We'll need to talk to the doctor, and he will make a final examination. He will be able to give you a lot more detail. Um, it, I'll be very technical. And all mommy and daddy heard was funny bone. And they closed their eyes and threw their hands up in the air and said, oh, oh. Nurse Fran called the doctor's office right then and there. And the soonest appointment that she was able to make was September 17th. But then she explained to them that there was a funny bone involved. And the doctor's office moved the appointment right up till this week. You don't mess with funny bones. Hammond already knew he had done such a wrong thing by Polly, and he already felt guilty, but now he felt even more, more awful. And when he traded Polly's arm to correct his own Tusami Han, he had no idea that this was going to cause such pain for his sister and his whole family. Haman ran into his bedroom, and he cried and cried and cried to be continued. <laughs> John's Gospel, the sixth chapter. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. So I've got about six chapters to get through from where our lesson finished off last week to where it picked up today. I'm going to do that as best as I can, and I'm going to try to make it as PG-13 as possible, but it's really an NC-17 story. Go home, read, read 2 Samuel 12 through 18. You'll understand what I mean. So last week we heard the conclusion of David and Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan. Immediately in the very next chapter, we get the story... This, the, Everything just really goes off the rails. We, get this, we start off with the story of David's oldest son, a guy named Amnon, who has, let's call it a major crush for his half-sister, Tamar. Amnon manipulates Tamar to come to his quarters where he sexually assaults her, and then when he's finished, he tosses her away like a used tissue. So Tamar then goes to her full brother, Absalom, tells him what their half-brother Amnon has done. Absalom allows Tamar to live with him, and then Absalom takes two years to plot homicidal revenge on his eldest brother. Once that is finally carried out, Absalom has to go into hiding because he has killed the king's firstborn son. Uh, But he is eventually reconciled to his father, the king, through the machinations of General Joab. Joab is about the only guy in all of uh, Judah and Israel that can confront David and tell him what to do other than the prophet Nathan. So Absalom returns to Jerusalem, but it takes another two years before David officially and publicly forgives Absalom. Once that happens, Absalom spends about four years ingratiating himself into the hearts and the minds of the citizenry. He does this by standing out by the gate, and he welcomes people as they enter Jerusalem. And as they they enter, he asks them why they're there. And if they happen to say that they are there to have a dispute settled, Absalom says to them, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no one deputed by the king to hear you. If only I were judge in all the land, then all who had a suit or cause might come to me, and I would give them justice. This guy's a piece of work. So eventually, Absalom goes to his father, the king, and he says, Dad, um, I made a vow when I was on the run from you then that I need to go to Hebron, to the temple there in Hebron, to fulfill this vow. And this whole vow thing is a load of heart load of horse hockey. But um, Absalom, David gives Absalom some permission to head to Hebron, uh, and he even allows uh, Absalom to take along a small entourage of only 200 officials. Um, Unbeknownst to David, though, Absalom has sent word ahead to the northern tribes that when he gets to Hebron, they are to declare him king. He gets to Hebron, they declare him king. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, David gets word of all of this, that Absalom now has the backing of the ten northern tribes to be king. So David and all of his remaining loyalists hightail it out of Jerusalem, and they go into hiding. David, however, is able to leave a couple of moles behind so that he can keep track of what Absalom is planning. Now, 
Absalom returns to Jerusalem, takes over the palace, officially declares himself king by doing, among other things, having sex with David's concubines in public. This guy is like a dog marking his territory. Okay? Shortly thereafter then, Absalom goes to battle against David. Now, one thing we need to understand about Absalom is that unlike some of us, Absalom is not follically challenged. He's got a head full of long, luxuriant, strong hair. And so he's going into battle, riding his trusty steed, but he happens to be going to this particular battle in a forest, in a densely forested wood with branches hanging low, and his hair gets caught and tangled into some of the branches. And Absalom is left literally hanging by his hair. That's where our reading today picks up. Joab and his soldiers come along. They see Absalom hanging there. And against David's direct orders, as we heard read, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. Joab takes his spear and thrusts it into Absalom and then has his soldiers finish Absalom off. David is informed of Absalom's death. We heard that. That's what the Cushite told to David. And David goes into a time of mourning. And that's where our reading pretty much stops. Now, before we feel too sorry for him, we have to remember that God did warn David. Last week, we heard when the prophet Nathan confronted David over his sexual conquest of Bathsheba and his subsequent arranged murder of her husband Uriah, Nathan prophesied, Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes, give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Today we get to see yet another low point in the life of David. We're reminded that David is not always a good guy. As a matter of fact, we see that David is a fundamentally flawed human being. In other words, David is a lot like me. I have messed up more relationships than I can count with with people that I dated, with friends, with family members, with teachers, classmates, congregation members, my spouse. I have to work diligently not to say mean and sarcastic things, especially when I'm ticked off. But if we replace the name of David with the name God. And we replace the name Absalom with John or George or Larry or Susan or Carolyn or Debbie or whatever your name is. How do you start to feel about the story then? Now hopefully no one here ever raped a sibling or or murdered anyone, I really hope nobody here is planning to overthrow the government. But I would bet that most of us, if not all of us, have thought or spoken badly about someone else, that we've thought about or maybe even tried to get revenge on someone for a real or perceived wrong. We may well have even thought that the world would be a better place if a specific person or a few people were no longer counted among the living. And thinking in that way, David's responses are kind of relevant to my life. I'm not 
plotting revenge murder on anyone. But this morning, morning when I was driving in on 15, doing 65 and a 55, and four vehicles came whipping around me on both sides, and all four of them pulled directly in front of me, I did think about speeding up, pulling around all the way in front of all of them, and suddenly putting my brakes on. I'm not a nice guy. Maybe... Maybe you're remembering that time that your boss chewed you out in front of the entire office and you, you're remembering all of those responses that you wish you would have said at that time. Or, or you remember that time when, which was it, your, your best friend or your spouse did that thing? You know, that thing. And so in order to get back to them, you did that thing that you know really gets to them. Absalom was not nice to a lot of people. Rape, insurrection, public indecency, inciting civil war. Did he get what was coming to him? Did did he get what he deserved? Did he deserve such an ignoble death? I don't really know. Did. Absalom's father, anointed king of all of Judah and Israel, ancestor of Jesus, he's pretty highly regarded. But he also was not nice to a lot of people. He abused his position of power. He ordered the murder of an innocent man, and through his inaction, he condoned the atrocious, reprehensible actions of his own sons. Did David get what he deserved? Did David get what was coming to him? Do any of us get what we deserve? Yeah, maybe that promotion that you were passed over, even though you were the most qualified one in your office with all of the experience. Or or maybe you didn't get the grade on that paper that you were really trying for, that you put in all of those extra hours and you got the same grade as everybody else in the class, and you know most of your classmates just pretty much slacked off. But what about all those other times that we didn't get what we deserved? Like the time that you didn't see the stop sign and just blew right through that intersection? Or, or, or when you said the thing that you thought was going to make you look really witty amongst all of your friends, but was really pretty crass and thoughtless. Do any of us get what we deserve? Because God sees our sin. God knows our sin. God is hurt to the core by our sin. And God most definitely does not give to us what we deserve because of our sin. God calls us to change. God wants us to change. God loves us enough to change. God calls each and every one of us to turn from our sin, to turn from the wrong that we so willingly do, to turn from the ways that we so willingly hurt one another God calls us rather to turn to the new life that comes to us. That comes to us in the water and the word. That comes to us in the bread and the wine, in the body and blood. God gives us love and grace and forgiveness none of which we can ever earn, none of which we deserve. Thanks be to God that God does that. Amen. Please stand as you're able. Join me in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in our loving and almighty God, who abundantly provides the bread of life to all who hunger, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Lord God, we thank you that you do not give us what we deserve, but rather treat us with grace. Teach us to forgive one another in love and build each other up. Hear us, O God. Lord God, it feels as though half the world is either on fire, suffering from drought or too much rain, from earthquakes, landslides, or other disasters. Help us to be your hands to those in need, to reach out in your grace, no matter who or where needs help. Hear us, O oh God. Lord God, inspire us to be generous with our time, talent, and treasure, giving in proportion to the gifts we have been given. Help us care for creation and the people you have put in our lives. Unite us with a sense of purpose and dedication to our mission. Hear us, O oh God. Lord God, we pray for those who are dealing with illness, pain, or sorrow. Bless the ones caring for them, and let your hand of grace and healing rest upon the sick as we lift before you Bonnie Sadler, Bob Telford, Judy Spinagle, Barb Wagner, Nina Menke, Virginia Bush, Dean Zirkel, Sue Kerr, and all those that we name in our hearts or on our lips. Hear us, O oh God. Lord God, we pray for those gathered here today. Guide our hearts that we strive to live as you would have us and not give in to our selfish nature. We pray this week for our Trinity brothers and sisters, Nikki Naylor, Sandy Nagy, Jack and Martha Nagel, Jane Myers, Daryl and Linda Myers, Elaine Murray, Bill Murray and Christine Ray, Madison and Evan Murray, and Sonia Murphy. Hear us, O oh God. Lord God, we give you thanks for Lois Tress and all the lives of those faithful ones who have gone before us. Praise all at the last day that we may exalt your name together. Hear us, O oh God. Almighty and loving God, we look to you in hope and trust, knowing that you, will do f do more f that you will do far more than we can ask or imagine. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share that peace with one another.
Let us pray. Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ is here. With joy, we lift up our hearts. Almighty God, we praise you, for you are the source of all goodness. When we sinned and turned away, you gave us your Son, Jesus Christ, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. He shared our human nature, and by his death on the cross, he brought us your forgiveness. You raised him from death, forever destroying its sting. In him, you make us a holy people by pouring upon us your spirit of life and power. Through this meal, join us together with one another in the bond of your son's love. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and gave it for all to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. Amen. May God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, grant you the gifts of faith and hope. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Jesus, hope of the nations, Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness, Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to life. You are the
serve. Thanks be to God. We will.